It's a very special day for me. Uh, academics don't usually like you to see their work before it's published. I, however, have an advanced copy, not for publication, for discussion purposes only, and all those disclaimers on it, written by the man on the other side of the screen, Jeff Corntassel. He is a uh, professor and instructor at the University of Victoria and writes about Indigenous issues. And uh, 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 by way of welcoming Professor Corntassel, I am going to have him introduce himself in his uh, uh, Cherokee language. Professor. Osio Wado Allen. Osio Nigata Jeff Ganoholito Corntassel Dagwadoa Shalagi Ayetli Gwena Sai Echoda Galski Goi Gali Heliga GJ Doha. So it's good to be here. And uh, thank you for inviting me to, um, to talk about some of these topics. And my name is Jeff Corntassel. I'm from Cherokee Nation. Uh, so we have three uh, kind of Cherokee nations. We have the Eastern Band, we have the United Katua Band, and then the largest is the Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma. And we have 370,000 uh, enrolled members. So I'm one of those uh, citizens. And um, we we're talking a little earlier about how my family is originally from Toko, Tennessee, and Lookout Point, Georgia, and we were forcibly removed uh, in 1838 um, to what became Westville, Oklahoma. So it's good well, to be here. Yeah, Trail of Tears, which is another and horrific story, which um, perhaps we can have you back and discuss. I was going to say, um, uh, with no reference to that, did you uh, take a wrong turn or how did you end up in Victoria? Yeah, I think... Uh, of uh, removal kind of led to subsequent removal. So in the 1930s, uh, a lot of Cherokee families left Oklahoma and went to places like California, went to places like uh, Oregon to find work. And so my family is one of those. We ended up in originally in Butte, Montana, and then went down the coast to uh, where I was born as Long Beach, California. Well, so or Oregon a lot of is- migration. Oregon is really supposed to be Canada, but I will leave that uh, to another topic. And I will that's also... a whole other that's a whole other section there. Yeah, absolutely. And um, that that yeah. could lead us into the Louisiana Purchase. I don't want to get into that either. Um, <laughs> so, Jeff Corntassel, let me uh, just start uh, by giving you a free reign to discuss your chosen uh, topics for the for the title. Um, your uh, article is entitled "Life Beyond the State." And then it has a subtitle, but let's start with life beyond the state. What could that mean? Yeah, I think, um, you know, George Manuel, who's uh, the late George Manuel, who's a Shaquetmec chief, uh, used to, I, I quoted him in some of my previous work where he says that we've truly become de- uh, colonized if we can't imagine kind of a governance system and can't imagine a uh, kind of a system of community um, camaraderie beyond that of the state. And so that kind of got me thinking about uh, to what degree are we colonized in our thinking to where we can't imagine other alternatives. And, you know, for indigenous nations, you know, we have some probably 5,000 indigenous nations around the world. And so I think within each of those nations, we have different forms of governance that are related to the land, that are related to the water. So that's kind of what got me thinking about it. The other part is I wanted to point out in the in this paper, but also in other works that life beyond the state doesn't mean we totally disengage from uh, state activity. It just means that we have other ways of governing that, that, that go beyond and predate often uh, the formation of that state. So uh, we like to say in the U.S. that as Cherokees, we're pre-constitutional. Uh, we, we existed pre, pre kind of U.S. government and pre-U.S. state. And so uh, with that came 10,000 years of experience around governance, around land management, around uh, relationships. Well, certainly. And you, you didn't ask me, of course, to uh, parse the title of your own article, but academics do like to Uh, debate the number of angels who can dance on the head of a pin. So in a way, you mean life beyond a certain state or life beyond this particular state, uh, because uh, the indigenous communities that I'm familiar with, and it's only a half dozen or so, 
they do have uh, state-like processes and yeah. methods and uh, so on. And some say um, the uh, your your former country, the U.S., uh, copied some of those in the in the uh, bicameral system. So you, you don't mean beyond any state. You don't mean like the withering away of the state that uh, Mark spoke of. I don't take it. Yeah, I think I don't think um, the state system is really going anywhere. Uh, you know, this is this is more about as indigenous nations, we have our own autonomy, we have our own self-governing authority, and that uh, doesn't necessarily always involve the state. And so we have kind of vibrant communities um, that are doing the day-to-day -day work of keeping up our ceremonies, keeping up our, our languages, keeping up our, our, our sacred living histories um, that don't necessarily um, involve the, the direct intervention of the state. And well, so and, and, and we more exist despite the state. <laughs> but mo more splitting of hairs though. It's despite the United States or the particular state of Oregon or the province of British Columbia or the uh, nation state of Canada, but it yeah. isn't beyond the state uh, the, the indigenous states or nations or communities or whatever they should be called, which I guess leads to that wonderful discussion of what is the difference between a people, a nation, a state, a nation state, because yeah. indigenous people are some or all of those things, aren't they? Yeah, although I, I would I would argue that, well, yeah, we could get into a whole lot of discussion around that, but I would argue that there's a distinction be, to be made between nations and states. And so I focus on indigenous nationhood. I view it as a community that is um, uh, has a common kind of ancestry, has a common set of beliefs, and a common relationship to a particular place. Uh, so that place may be, you know, as I mentioned, Tennessee, what's now Tennessee, that may, that place is usually uh, related to our origin stories, it's re usually related to our language, it's related to all that long living history, as I mentioned. States I view as they're legally recognized entities, and we have, you know, over 200, right, in the world today, that are uh, that recognize each other based on this notion of sovereignty and based on the notion of a defined territory and based on a notion of control over that territory within those boundaries. And so, uh, so I always differentiate between nation and state. Um, and when you put those two together, I actually think the nation state for the most part is a myth. We don't see a one-to-one -one correlation between the nation, i.e. indigenous nations, and the country, uh, like the United States, we have multiple nations in the US, for example, uh, over 575 federally recognized nations or tribes. Um, and we could think of another 200 that aren't even federally recognized. Same in Canada, over 672 First Nations, uh, including Inuit and Métis. So I, I think uh, most states are multinational and, and the nation state hides that uh, with that terminology because it assumes a one-to-one -one correlation. Well, and also there would be some overlap as in a Venn diagram between nations and states which have some overlapping jurisdiction. And I, what comes to mm -hmm. my mind apropos of nothing is that most of the Japanese live in Japan and most of the Irish do not live in Ireland, especially yeah. anywhere near St. Paddy's Day, but uh, perhaps that's yeah. a diversion. Now, now just, just to give a window on how long this discussion could go, all we've just discussed so far <laughs> is, is the title of your this article. Is the title. This is and, what happens. This is what happens. And now we have the subtitle, Regenerating indigenous international relations. Now, the way I parse that, and you know, I'm just an old English major, uh, you are regenerating something that used to exist. So there must have been indigenous international relations many generations ago. It, is that, yeah. have I got that meaning correct? You do, you do. So I think um, uh, I'm playing a bit on the field of international relations, which in in kind of mainstream political science focuses on the interactions between states. And so what I'm trying to point out is that there is a particular type of international relations that take place 
among indigenous nations, uh, usually between uh, indigenous nations, uh, other indigenous nations, but also indigenous nations and states. As we know, there's a whole long history of treaty making uh, that occurred between, you know, let's say Cherokee Nation and the U.S. government. But I, what I'm trying to pull out of this is we also have a long history of making alliances or compacts between uh, other nations, other indigenous nations, such as Cherokees and Creeks, uh, you know, Cherokees and, and Shawnee. So, uh, and then the other part of it is that our, our, I guess our agreements aren't limited to other um, kind of legal entities and other recognized entities. So we made compacts or agreements, uh, Leanne Simpson talks about, between the hoof nations. Uh, we made compacts and agreements with the plant nations, uh, compact and, and agreements between uh, the deer nation, as I mentioned in, in some of the, the Cherokee stories that we have. So, so those stories also give us insight into how we build these relationships. And they aren't necessarily formalized always in a treaty, but they're their agreements, their sacred compacts in some ways, well, and, the ways that we should interact. And yeah. so the international relations uh, between and among indigenous uh, nations occurred, uh, certainly within North America, but I've also uh, had uh, discussions uh, with a, a Chinese deputy minister, for example, who says that in his region of China, there, is, there are folk songs and stories of people who live in what look a lot like teepees and who use boats that look a lot like canoes. And the folklore is uh, when there's a uh, famine and you can't find enough food, uh, get in your boat and keep rowing. And it's going to appear like, uh, you know, there's nowhere to go, but keep going and going and going and you'll find some islands. And he thinks that's uh, one of the ways that uh, North America was settled, and there may have already been people here. So the international relations could have also been outside North America. Would you agree with that? Absolutely, absolutely. So this is global in scope. So I would say just like there are indigenous peoples all throughout the world, um, you know, in Asia, especially, um, you know, these, these relationships occurred. And Who's to say that there weren't relations between Cherokees and other uh, particular groups? You know, I, we may not have that in our our and my limited understanding of our oral history, but they they certainly I think existed, and just as they did up and down the Americas, uh, they did this through trade routes, through trade relations and diplomatic relations as well. Now, um, I don't want to. Um quote Sarah Palin too much here about, you know, Russia being visible from her front porch, but uh, America being where it is and Canada being where we are, uh, we have an interest in circumpolar relations with people who um, abut our territory around the pole. And and that that's an, some official uh, Canadian foreign policy. So I think that we should be receptive to your idea of Indigenous relations uh, around the world what what do you see it accomplishing or what is its purpose? I think uh, and that's an interesting uh, tie into Sarah Palin. <laughs> I didn't expect the Sarah Palin quote. Uh, but I, I think it, it leads to maybe deeper or sometimes new alliances that can that can help um, in the case of the Helsic and Haida Treaty can help protect a particular species at risk, in this case, the herring. Uh, but I, you know, I think of the Inuit Circumpolar Conference, right, which is a gathering of, of Inuit peoples that helps protect uh, sea ice and helps protect uh, their lands from, uh, from climate change and from, you know, from all of the, the changes that have occurred in their community. So I think it, it allows us to be stronger in solidarity together. And that's you know, that's not a new idea, um, but I, I think it's certainly uh, a key part that's overlooked in a lot of the literature on international relations and, and some of the literature on even countries. Well, always, uh, always uh, self-deprecating for a professor to say he's writing up something that isn't a new idea. That's, uh, that's, a, new, that's a new idea. <laughs> uh, it's a new concept. But, but right. one of the things I'm trying to do is not divert attention from your work, but try to have a, a window of, of understanding on it. Because for example, in the OECD, we have 2,800 
uh, treaties and trade agreements, and everybody yeah. thinks that's just fine, why wouldn't we have the kind of treaties you talk about in your article among women or to protect the herring or for other uh, purposes? So th this seems to be a logical and parallel way of doing something to what uh, uh, industrialized countries have been doing for 100 years. Yeah, and I think we... Um it originated with us. <laughs> I'll be, this is where I'll be unabashed. Uh, it originated with us in terms of, we have done these agreements for, you know, 10,000 years. And so uh, this is where I think we have a deeper sense of relational responsibility to the land and to those relations to keep them up. And, and I think, as I point out in some of the examples that I use that those relations are renewed in ways that maybe other treaties aren't. Um, they're renewed on an annual basis or ceremony. They're changed and altered to fit, which other treaties are certainly. Uh, but I think they're more enduring because they have in, at their core uh, this, this notion of respect and, and, and ultimately friendship. Okay, so now we're through the title and the subtitle of your article. <laughs> maybe we could get into the um, the body of it. I think we've already dealt with the notion of solidarity across colonial borders. Um, but of course, uh, indigenous nations had their own borders and sometimes friction and, and a lack of solidarity. So, you know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And it's not always, uh, well, it's not ever a monolithic indigenous hundreds of, of nations that are, that are, um, uh, that are um, of the same mind about a topic. Speak to that if you would. Yeah, absolutely. I don't, uh, the last thing I wanna do is paint a romanticized view of, of you know, indigenous international relations. Uh, certainly we had our conflicts. In fact, Cherokees, we had uh, border disputes regularly with the Creek and with other nations. And, but we had different methods of resolving those. In the uh, case of Cherokees and Creeks, we would do stickball and stickball was a form of uh, an alternate to war, all out war. And it was basically all out war on a, a smaller field uh, where we'd have 60 people on each side and uh, very few rules governing the, you know, how you were gonna play that stickball game. So some people died during these stickball games uh, from their injuries. Um, and so, you know, this was an alternative to uh, expanding all of this time and effort on obliterating each other. Uh, and it was an accepted means of conflict resolution determined uh, by the, the winner of that. Yeah. Jeff Corntassel is at the University of Victoria and speaking via Zoom. And we're talking about Life Beyond the State, Regenerating Indigenous International Relations, his soon to be published article. And you said international actions can sometimes uh, render the state redundant. And I think that that's a truism. People worry about globalization, the supply chain, even more now than, than even a year ago. Um, the uh, aforementioned 2,800 treaties between OECD countries has a slight tendency to reduce national sovereignty. So uh, speak to that, because in the efforts of creating an international uh, rapprochement, as we say in Canada, among Indigenous nations, there is a slight diminution of their individual sovereignty, perhaps. Perhaps. I think um, I th what I was getting at there with that, with that quote is really, you know, that there are things that we do in terms of our governance that uh, we don't need external uh, intervention. Um, we don't need a municipal oversight or uh, an oversight from a province. We have our own kind of ways of governing uh, that involve, you know, councils that involve hereditary chiefs that involve uh, different um, kinds of values and different kinds of, of uh, I guess, principles. And so, yeah, I think I think there is a there always is a, a slight. Um, when you make these agreements, there's a slight sacrifice of some of your autonomy. But I think the idea is that in solidarity, you're even stronger and than you were before. So collect, there's a collective mindset. And, and so in that sense, it's not about 
a vulnerability, it's actually a strengthening of your, of your community. It's a strengthening of your, uh, if we're talking about a trade network, for example, it's strengthening your food systems uh, and your access to food. Now, many Americans, uh, as you know, are quite paranoid about the UN, including uh, some uh, private militias thinking there are UN soldiers hiding in salt mines ready to come out and take over and um, all that stuff. Uh, now, you know, that would be serious single digits of the population. It's, it's easy to chuckle at it, but it's, it's a serious thing. I raise that because what will those people and others think of some sort of indigenous autonomy and self-determination in a, in a global sense that is trying to transcend national borders. I mean, that sounds uh, as bad as the UN. <laughs> uh, I, I would just, I, I laugh at that because it's, it's um, uh, I, I don't think the UN has the capacity to, to send out agents, let alone even conduct some of its own business. But uh, they could, they could it, now, in fairness, they could have a very good long meeting about a topic. They could have a lot of committee meetings about it. But <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I think, you know, to, to folks that are concerned, uh, I would say that we've been managing the environment and managing our lands for over 10,000 years, and we've been doing just fine. Uh, in fact, what we need is a, uh, as Vine Deloria used to say, a cultural leave us alone agreement in spirit and in fact. So being left alone allows us to do the kinds of work. Uh, and in a sense, you know, we, we are protecting 80% of the biodiversity in the world today uh, by some stats. And so, um, you know, we're protecting this biodiversity so that future generations can thrive, not just indigenous peoples, uh, everyone. And so in that sense, um, you know, we need to be uh, able to do that kind of work to facilitate those kinds of relationships so that future generations can also thrive. Now you uh, so get, that'd be my argument to that. Yeah. You get a, a wee bit mystical here where you talk about the renewal of more than human relationships. Um, are you uh, speaking of, um, uh, I assume you're speaking of the relationships with uh, other biomass, uh, flora and fauna in the world. Uh, is that correct? Yeah. And so, uh, you know, we have a story of how medicine came to the people, for example, and it was basically because Cherokees forgot their, they lost their way and they were forgetting to honor the deer when they were killing the white-tailed deer. And so the deer held a council. I'll give you the short version of the story. The deer held a council and decided that they were going to punish Cherokees for failing to, to honor their, their kin, their, their fallen kin. So, um, they gave us disease and the plant nations actually came to our rescue and said, we're gonna help Cherokees and provide medicines. Uh, and so, you know, these plant nations held their own council and, and just like the deer and the other animal nations. And so that's what I mean by more than human. It's not just about us, it's about all of our stories talk about different animals and plants and different relations that, that are significant in our world. Um, and so as humans, we're just part of that. We're not, we're always on, um, we're always in a tenuous relationship, in fact, with some of the animals uh, as the deer story, as the medicine story goes. I'm trying to think of the name of the discipline and it's just flown right out of my mind, but the Norwegian ecologist uh, Arne Nast, I think, uh, developed it in the early seventies of an equivalency among the species so that, uh, you know, certain plants, animals, bugs, etc., were the equivalent uh, uh, of, uh, of humans. Uh, does that ring a bell to you? Because I've lost the name of that discipline. I don't remember the name of that either. Um, that'll be something that we'll, we'll Google later and realize that. Ah, we'll deep, do it. deep ecology. Deep, deep ecology. ecology. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, I think that that resonates somewhat. I think I think there's always kind of a, what I guard against is kind of a, a Western notion of conservation or environmentalism that's being imposed on uh, sometimes as a standard for indigenous worldviews or indigenous practices. But, uh, and so there's always pushback against those different standards or worldviews, especially if you're applying a European word or a European standard to, to a Cherokee worldview or, or belief system. 
but yeah, absolutely. I think there's a, that's a starting point. And even the uh, recognition in 2017 in Aotearoa or New Zealand of uh, rivers having legal standing as persons, that's a starting point. And I think those are, those are significant events that help us better understand how to, to take care of these, these entities that, you know, again, more than human relations. Well, that's a great case. And uh, mainstream uh, so-called Western lawyers in, uh, in the UK that I'm familiar with 25 years ago tried to obtain standing at uh, public hearings for flora and fauna, which was an interesting idea. And I just asked the question, yes, but who do they bill at the end of the, the process? And I, I haven't got a satisfactory answer. Um, yeah. Let me tell you, I like some of your turns of phrases, the exist, resist, and persist turn of a phrase I thought was uh, pretty good stuff. And uh, the relationships to land, community, and culture. And I think sometimes that's a little hard for some people to get their mind around, unless you have camped somewhere or gone to a friend's cottage or lived in a particular neighborhood uh, or even played stickball in Brooklyn uh, sure. and had an egg cream. I mean, this is the stuff of movies that there is attachment to the past and the land. And I think you've captured that well, uh, if I may say. Now, I just wanted to show you how superficial I can be. And I'm simply proofreading your article here. Uh, because it, <laughs> okay. it is pre-publication. You, 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 yes. you, you are seeking input. I notice your reference to decentering the politics of recognition, that's decentering, recentering indigenous nationhood, and decenter the state. Um, it, it, it seems to me that decentering, recentering, and decenter are kind of used interchangeably. Is mm. that on purpose? Because recenter should be something different than decenter, shouldn't it? Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's it for me. At the end of the day, uh, it's about recentering indigenous nationhood and recentering our relationships that keep us healthy. And so those relationships run a whole, you know, as we've talked about, are are pretty complex, and they run a whole range from recentering our relationships to the land. Uh, and recentering our relationships to those more than human relations. So, and again, yeah. angels on the head of the pin argument. Does that mean making the land and other such things you speak of more central to uh, indigenous life and indigenous nationhood? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, we're talking about we're talking about how land is really uh, we're place based peoples. We're, you know, and those, so those place-based relationships are what keep us healthy, are they're what keep us vibrant as indigenous nations. And they really, I would argue that those relationships, you know, uh, culturally form the basis for our political sovereignty, form the basis for our, our self-determining authority as peoples. Makes sense and thank you. And, and even more trivial and superficial on my part, uh, you do refer to, um, quote, British Columbia, end quote, and the so-called British Columbia, <laughs> but then the actual BC Premier John Horgan, uh, the Lenape Territory, and that isn't in quotation marks, and Quebec, which isn't in quotation marks. So I would submit that so-called British Columbia is actually called that, and you would have to concede that point. But what is the point you're making about the quotations and the so-called in some cases, but not in others? Uh, that's just an inconsistency uh, that, that can be rectified with quotation marks or something. And, that's and, not a real. And I said I was, I said I was superficial. Um, yeah. the, were the Lenape in, in, I know that they are certainly central to Manhattan, but were they also in, in what is now the other boroughs, as far as you know? I think they were. I don't have a real strong sense of Lenape kind of history, but yeah, I think they were in that general region for sure. Fant fantastic exhibit at the Museum of the City of New York, which shows in time lapse uh, imagery the um, you know the the settlements and so on and so forth. Um, you have been very indulgent, including in my superficial proofreading. Thank you so much. Um, is there anything you'd like to add before we wrap up? Because your perspective is really interesting, both as a Cherokee, a resident of America, and, and a scholar. So thank you. 
Yeah. Yeah. What do for having me on? I think, um, no, it's, you know, a lot of this is kind of couched as, you know, in some of the kind of current movements it's couched as land back, you know, so this discussion of land back, and I didn't really discuss that in the paper at all, but you could think of resurgence as another aspect of, of a land back movement. Um, and it's really about protecting these relationships that we hold so uh, so dearly and these relationships that are really about our future as indigenous people. So when we talk about climate change, when we talk about climate action, um, you know, for indigenous peoples, we're often on the front lines of that. And so we're doing, uh, we're taking these actions so that our, not only our communities can thrive, but also so, so that the land and the water can be vibrant um, for future generations. So it's not just for us in that sense, it's for, uh, as, as the late Benny Smith, who was a Cherokee elder, used to say, Cherokee is for everyone. And so we're sharing this uh, with the idea that it's an invitation for solidarity, but it's also an invitation for taking action so that we can, um, so we can address some of these pressing issues of the day. Well, that's a great quote, Cherokee is for everyone. Uh, since you uh, grew up in America, you might not be familiar with the Canadian author, uh, Dr. King, uh, who uh, wrote a book called The Inconvenient Indian. And he was oh, also yes, one, of, yeah. one of the writers on the, uh, the Dead Doc Cafe on, on CBC Radio. And in The Inconvenient Indian, he says, in the 60s, everybody wanted to be Indian, including the Indians. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Thank you so much for your work and uh, your time today. Well, no, thanks for having me on. Cheers. Take care.